Hello and welcome. The Max was a 13-episode animated series that ran on MTV's Oddities in 1995. Oddities was an offshoot of Liquid Television, which contained a variety of short, usually experimental cartoons, the most well-known possibly being Aeon Flux. Oddities was intended to be a long-form version of Liquid Television. It focused on complete story arcs over a number of episodes, as opposed to the short, self-contained cartoons seen on Liquid Television. The first half of the season was the series The Head, which began in September 1994 and ran until March 1995. The second half of the season was The Max, which originally ran between April and June of 1995. An important side note, there was a hybrid soundtrack slash audiobook version of The Max. This audiobook, Maximum Sound, was produced in 1993 by Animated Alligator, two years before the Oddity series debuted. This audiobook sounds amazingly similar to the animated series, but there are differences, most notably in the voice talent and the fact that it includes a few musical interludes. Also, it only covers the first three issues of the series. Presumably, this audiobook was used to showcase the potential for a Max animated series. The scripts for both seem functionally identical. For the record, the audiobook itself is only available on cassette. It wasn't released on CD, even though that technology was widely available at the time. For those interested, links to the audiobook are provided in the description below this video. The animated series starred the voice talent of Michael Haley as the Max, Glennis Tolkien as Julie Winters, Amy Daniels as Sarah, and Barry Stigler as Mr. Gone, all of whom do a very good job in their respective roles. The Max has a growling, deep voice. He sounds like a character that could be narrating a movie trailer, but that trailer happens to be his own internal thoughts. There is also a shade of the wrestler, Randy Savage, in his voice. It's very toned down, but it is there. It sounds like rage being constantly restrained. Mr. Gon's voice is somewhat reminiscent of Mark Hamill's portrayal of the Joker from the Batman animated series. He's menacing and slightly whimsical. He feels superior because he understands how the puzzle pieces of Julie's mind fit together, and he knows how everyone is connected in this little drama play. Julie's voice is calm, with a very slight raspy undercurrent that suggests she's just a touch cynical or existentially tired, or both. She seems restrained and not overly expressive. She keeps herself constantly in check, never revealing more than necessary. Sarah is a little stereotypical as an emotionally distant, overly jaded young person. She's too apathetic or pretentious to talk too far above a nasally monotone. Still, the character of a young woman dealing with the loss of her father shines through. Overall, these all seem like very fine creative choices for the characters they portray. Sam Keith, the creator of The Max, was heavily involved in the series. He oversaw the entire production, from the script to storyboards. He even provided some backgrounds for the first episode. Obviously, he wasn't at the studio daily because his day job was writing and drawing the comic book, but he did regularly provide input. Visually speaking, the overall aesthetic is derived entirely from the Max comic. Apparently, scans of the comic were used by the animators during production. So, in some respects, it does look like an early version of what's known nowadays as a motion comic. But, to suggest the Max is nothing more than an early draft of motion comics would be far too reductive. Along with traditional animation, there are some other interesting techniques used in the series. For example, in the first episode, I'm reasonably certain the scene is a live-action silhouette, with the Max animated over top. The streets seen as they are driving by are likely put in by a process known as luma keying, or possibly by rear screen projection. But luma keying is more likely. Basically, that's three elements in one sequence, and it all works seamlessly. The second episode opens with an impossibly long tracking shot, not only do we see people doing what they do in the privacy of their own homes, but it also flashes to the outback in places. As a piece of animation, it's quite amazing. As a final example, episode number 5 contains some very early computer animation. So, there is a mixture of coherent and complementary styles throughout the series. 
It does rely on the motion comic element, but it's used in a very natural manner, and it's usually mixed with traditional animation. At this point, it's worth pointing out, there are a fair amount of elements that are intentionally left open to interpretation. So, take the following as one person's interpretation of the material. Certainly, there may be other interpretations, and they may be equally valid. With that in mind, let's move forward. The story itself is about Julie Winters and her fractured personality, which is protected by her spirit animal, the Max. The story shifts between the outback, also known as Pangea, and reality, where Julie works as a freelance social worker. Julie is constantly harassed by a self-professed serial killer known as Mr. Gone. He delights in taunting her by admitting to his own misdeeds, and by alluding to the repressed truth about Julie's past. It's all done under the guise of getting her to finally accept the traumatic events that have shaped her into the person she has become. On the surface, this is an altruistic deed, but it's done using the most malicious methods. Being a contradiction is a consistent character trait for Mr. Gone. It's difficult not to notice that Mr. Gone's head is very phallic, and when he confronts Julie about the abuse she has suffered, she severs this appendage from his body. Twice, in fact. Faced with the symbolic object of her trauma, she subconsciously reacts with violence. It's a very primal human response. Julie's denial is quite profound. And this manifests as the superhero, the Max. The Max is there to protect Julie and Julie's internalized ideal self, the Jungle Queen. As seen in the series, this ideal self transforms into the Leopard Queen, a dark, brooding version of herself that can no longer deal with the issues in the Outback. The Outback is an existential area between the subconscious and the unconscious mind. It exists to contain Julie's repression. Originally, it formed during Julie's childhood in order to deal with the death of a bunny. However, over time, it has become infested and overrun with issues that can no longer be contained. There is an interesting dimension to Julie and Max's codependent relationship. Ostensibly, the Max is there to help, and he does what he can to protect the outback in Julie's subconscious mind, and to protect her from Mr. Gone in the conscious world. Objectively, he's somewhat ineffective at both. After all, the outback continues to deteriorate despite his involvement. Mr. Gone also kidnaps Julie, and the Max doesn't help whatsoever in her release from captivity. In fact, he seems unaware she's missing. Ultimately, one could say, the Max exacerbates or prolongs Julie's internal struggle by enabling her denial. His intentions are good and not necessarily misguided, but his whole existence is dependent upon Julie's struggle. Without that, there is no need for him to exist. Therefore, the Max's entire purpose is dependent on Julie's continual repression. Once she faces the truth of her past and accepts it, the Max becomes unnecessary. On some level, he seems to know this. This is what leads to the ending of the series. Julie is told the truth and, to some degree, accepts it. Part of this truth comes from the severed head of Mr. Gone. That truth being, she was randomly assaulted years ago and has buried that memory deep inside, deep in the outback. But suppression of that evil cannot be contained. Her denial is in a state of failure. The truth is confirmed when Julie sees what's behind the Max's mask. She's confronted with undeniable proof that the Max is a result of the trauma she avoids addressing. This makes it necessary for Julie to move forward with her life. Furthermore, she refuses to feel guilt over her decision to move on. In a manner of speaking, by moving forward, Julie is reclaiming the power that has been displaced onto the Max. For a period of time, the Max was necessary, but that time has passed. Symbolically, the Max held a portion of Julie's internal strength, and he carried that power with him until she could reclaim it. Honestly, I'm not married to that interpretation, but at the same time, I don't think it's wildly off the mark. All of this is a subversion of expectations, especially towards superhero tropes. The large, overly muscled man does not save the day. He is, quite possibly, in the way of salvation. And yes, one could read this as a statement that men and their overly protective nature can interfere with a woman's growth. While the Max has a very clear motivation in the animated series, his origin, so to speak, is only hinted at very, very briefly. This isn't necessarily a flaw, 
But it's worth pointing out that Julie and Max's history is examined with more depth in the comic book. That examination is done in the issues that follow the story explored in the animated series. And, again, it's a subversion of expectation. Superheroes always have an origin story that's usually told up front. But the Max's origin is buried and only alluded to on occasion. It's not an irrelevant part of the story, but it's not the most important either. For those wondering, after all of these years, yes, the Max is an actual bunny under the mask. The bunny is Julie's protective spirit animal. Through a set of circumstances, a bunny, a lampshade, and a human melded to become the Max. If you look at Max's posture, he looks like a bunny sitting on his haunches, although it's somewhat distorted because the human form doesn't naturally assume that position. The Max's pronounced teeth are actually the fringe of a lampshade. The final scene of the animated series is not included in the comic book, although something related does happen off-panel following the 20th issue. In this scene, the Max transforms to his fully human self, and he's a gardener. The series fades out as he tends to some plants. It's simple, poignant, and a very fitting conclusion. It does gently contradict what comes later in the comic book, but not to a degree where they are fundamentally different. The animated series seems to provide a stronger feeling of closure. In the conclusion, the Max, or Dave, which is his actual name, may have ended up in his own outback, not in reality. After all, at one point, Mr. Gon asked the Max if he was curious about his own outback, which may have foreshadowed this scene. And it's possible the Max exited Julie's outback into his own outback. The Susadon plant in the glass shed seems to indicate this isn't reality. The wide open space also suggests a flatland area that's peaceful, isolated, and alone, like a person's subconscious. Overall, the series adheres to the plot and the narrative structure found in the first 11 issues of the Max comic book. As an adaptation, it's very faithful to the source material. More to the point, the experimental nature of the animation enhances the dark, subversive nature of the story. Like the comic book, around the ninth episode, all of the quirky elements start to tie together. The final two episodes come together very well, and the ending, which isn't directly part of the comic book, is understated and bittersweet. Not everything is resolved, but enough is given for the viewer to feel like it's complete. Interestingly, there is no huge climactic moment where everything is revealed. Instead, the pieces coalesce slowly. And the series respects the intelligence of the viewers to put it all together for themselves. Furthermore, where appropriate, there are abstract or existential pieces to interpret to one's satisfaction. In the end, it's no surprise this is a well-remembered and cherished series. It's a unique story told using unusual elements and methods, all of which enhance the viewing experience. That's it for today. Like, share, subscribe, and comment, and I will talk at you later. Until next time.